Assistance Artist Talk Series. My name is Gisela Carbonell, and I am the curator of the Cornell Fine Arts Museum at Rollins College. Tonight's presentation, Antonio Martorell, Puerto Rican art here and there during the pandemic, is generously supported by Art Bridges and by the Thomas P. Johnson Visiting Scholars and Artists Fund. I am delighted to have you here with me tonight for this program, and I hope that you will submit your questions and comments via the chat box. We will get to as many as we can. Our speaker tonight is one of the towering figures in the history of Puerto Rican and Caribbean art. Antonio Martorell was born in Santurce, Puerto Rico in 1939, and his prolific artistic career spans more than five decades and across fields. Martorell is a multimedia artist whose practice expands seamlessly from paintings and sculptures to installation, set design, theater, printmaking, illustration, cultural criticism and education, among other areas of inquiry. Martorell studied diplomacy at Georgetown University before shifting his focus to art making. Um, and for more than 30 years, he has been the artist in residence at the University of Puerto Rico at Calle, while also keeping a studio in Ponce, Puerto Rico. Martorell has published a memoir, La Piel de la Memoria, in 1991, and several other books, the most recent, Pierre de Encuentra, published last year. He hosted cult cultural TV programs such as En la Punta de la Lengua, a series that won five Emmy Awards, and for more than three decades, ha um, he has been co-host with Rosa Luisa Márquez in the radio program Uno, Dos, Tres, Probando um, on Radio Universidad de Puerto Rico. His work has been exhibited and collected in Puerto Rico and abroad, and is represented in private and public collections, including in the collection of the Cornell Fine Arts Museum. Recently, Martorell was commissioned by New York's governor, Andrew Cuomo, to design, in partnership with architect Segundo Cardona, a memorial to the victims of Hurricane Maria. Martorell's lifelong commitment to education drives him to speak to students of all ages, teach workshops, lecture, converse, share his knowledge, and support artists both on the island and the diaspora. Although his biography and curriculum can fill hundreds of pages, Tonight, I want us to focus. I want us to focus the conversation on Martorell's series of works related to the COVID-19 pandemic, and previous series in which he has addressed moments of crisis, such as the AIDS epidemic, the devastating effects of Hurricane Maria, and the earthquakes in Puerto Rico that shook the island um, before the pandemic. He has an amazing sense of humor, and as you'll see tonight, he is a great believer on the power of art to effect change in moments of crisis. We are honored to welcome Antonio Martorell. Martorell, welcome. Thank you, Gisela, for <laughs> that wonderful welcoming words. I hope to be up to the standards you set. Uh, <laughs> it is always great to speak to our people abroad. I mean, the diaspora in Puerto Rico is very, very important. And I cherish this opportunity to talk to our people in Florida and about the work we've been doing now for years and that we hope to keep it as pertinent as always. And I think it's been wonderful for you to select those particular words uh, that pertain to the pandemic and to all other disasters that we are so uh, used to, although we hate them. Uh, the other day we were talking on the phone and I told you that uh, looking about my work, and I've been reviewing my work now for years, I found out that I'm, I'm very much, uh, some definitions which are always tempting to do, and always off key, but we go at it. I, uh, I have come to the conclusion that I am a degenerate artist because <laughs> I don't belong to any generation. I, I also, was found, also found out that I'm a circumstantial artist because I kind of react to circumstances. But also I have learned uh, shortly, uh, Ago, when you told me about 
catastrophes and my response to them that I am a catastrophic artist. <laughs> but on top of it, and this I'm quoting Oscar Wilde, I am a superficial artist because I depend a lot on the surface of materials that are my best accomplices in the criminal act of art. Because <laughs> art is, it shares a lot with crime because we always, the artists are always look at with suspicion of a crime either committed or about to be committed. Uh, but I, I enjoy that. I well, love to be suspected of something <laughs> that I still haven't done, but I certainly will do. Well, with that in mind and thinking about how you approach what you call catastrophes or crisis and also handling different types of surfaces, let's take a look at some of the projects that you have worked on recently and then kind of go back in time. Um, so one of the first images that I want us to look at, if I can get my PowerPoint to work, um, is here is the um, design for the Hurricane Maria Memorial that you were commissioned to, um, to do uh, with Architect Segundo Cardona for um, Battery Park City in New York. So this is a work that um, is very beautiful and has this kind of ethereal quality. Can you tell us a little bit about what your goal is with this memorial and what are some of the nuances that we see in this design? Because here you're working with different kinds of surfaces and different kinds of materials when you approach an environment like this is a little different than when you approach perhaps a, um, a two-dimensional painting. Well, I'll tell you how it all came about. Uh, I had heard about the memorial and there's a contest. It, it was an open contest. And my friend Segundo called me, uh, say, let's go to it. I said, Segundo, no, I won't do it. I said, why not, Tonio? I said, because I hate to lose. I am a bad loser. So I, I hate to go on a contest where said, maybe we lose. He said, no, 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 we're going to win. I love to win. And he convinced me uh, with the vehemence that I would. So we had an, an idea that I loved, which is uh, we had worked together before. And I, I looked at it as a chance to develop words and images, which is very common in my work. And there is a poem by Julia de Burgos one of our foremost poets that I've been familiar with now for over half a century. And it's one of the few, very few poems she ever wrote in English when she lived in New York for a quite a, a long stretch. And it's <laughs> called Farewell from Welfare Island. And Welfare Island is now called Roosevelt Island. It was once, uh, uh, a jail, it was also a lunatic asylum, it was a hospital, and, and she wrote this in a, in, a, in a very sad moment of her life, and she was born in Puerto Rico and died in New York, and, and it's, it's a cry to the world, it's a cry of desperation, and also with some hope in it, because every work of art carries in it hope. If not, you wouldn't do it, even in the most desperate moments. So I said, well, we're going through a desperate moment just as Julia was at her time. And I decided I would do the whole landscape of the island, the sea, the sand, the clouds, the gathering storm, the sun, the stars, but do it all with the poem of Julia de Burgos, both in original English, and I took the enormous liberty and risk of translating into Spanish. So that's, and the, it's going to be, it's being fabricated right now. I, I painted it on linen, but now it's been, then it was photographed to be silk screen printed on glass and made into this curve, this spiral echoing the hurricane itself. And, and we'll, we're very anxious to see it. Uh, 
it was supposed to be done uh, earlier uh, this year, but with the pandemic, everything got postponed. As you were everything know. has yeah everything has been altered but you know i i'm i'm glad that we're able to show this um with our to share this with our audience tonight uh because this is an upcoming project and it's something recent that you have been working on and that we'll be able to see in new york of course um a place where so much of of puerto rico is represented there also in arts and culture um, so I'm going to try to forward here to another image um, of a uh, project that you worked on some few years ago, I think 2015, La Guagua Aérea. So this is a, a very different type of installation, um, just to share some background with our with our audience tonight. Can you tell us a little bit about this project and why um, it's so significant for you? Well, it, this is the second version of La Guagua Area. The first one was done in 1992 uh, in Museo del Barrio, and it took the text of uh, the herb of La Guagua Area, a beautiful, very meaningful text by our foremost writer, Luis Rafael Sanchez. Now, this second time around, uh, more than oh, over 30 years, Later, uh, I was called on the occasion of the a big exhibition in the Museo del Barrio about the history of New York, uh, ending in the 1960s. And they asked me to do it again, but in, a, in another way. So I picked up some letters from Doña Pura Belpré, uh, a marvelous uh, writer and teacher who worked at the New York Public Library and who was my personal friend. I illustrated one of her books, uh, The Rainbow Colored Horse, back in the, eight, in the 70s. And the, the inside of the plane is papered with a wallpaper of her letters and a friend of hers, both in calligraphy and in uh, type like typewriters of the time and the but the the thing the particular thing about this installation is the seats the seats are um we looked for well we had people from el barrio come in and do the workshops and they were assigned each a seat they would bring their own seat, a chair, and they would dress the chair like if it was a passenger of the 1940s and 50s and maybe as late as 60s, dress it up and in cushion in such a way that they, the, the actual chairs were the passengers and the people who came into the show would sit on the lap of the passengers and watch on a television screen a documentary of the Puerto Rican migration of those years. And it was fascinating. It, it had windows that with pictures of the people of the time, and they had notepads where uh, people could write down their impressions. And uh, it was amazing. Uh, some people really were moved to tears and recollecting their history, their parents, their grandparents, uh, friends and neighbors. And it, it, it was, it was a, a wonderful experience all the way. And I think we have some, some images on the screen of that installation of the outside and then what it looked like in the inside with the chairs dressed up in, in people's um, elements of clothing and, and, and things that recall their presence and their, their visibility. And so, these projects are really um, interesting to think about um, ways of connecting uh, Puerto Ricans, both from the island and and from here, and uh, shared experiences in both places, and also this idea of memory. And I think with the, I'm going to advance here for the next well, slide. Before, but before we go on to the next one, the whole idea of it was to make people conscious 
that they were taking the place of the immigrant, right. the immigrant's experience. You were sitting on their laps, you were becoming them. It was their vision. And that was that was silence. Yes. Let's go ahead. Okay, and that, that leads us to this work, um, which is the one that we have in the collection of our museum, and uh, we just acquired it last year. And this is a, a monumental piece that, um, for those of you who are with us tonight, if you haven't been to the museum to see it, I invite you to come and visit. This is a work, as you can see in these images, that is of monumental scale. And it's a work that that Martores that you produced um, after Hurricane Maria to give visibility to the victims, the, the people who perished um, after the hurricane or as a as a result of the hurricane and the inefficient management of the crisis. Um, and I thought this would be a good um, a good work to segue into the pandemic um, series and the other series that you have done addressing um, these events that show the inequalities and the differences in society that make some sectors of society overlooked. So can you share a little bit about, about this well, work? I was overwhelmed by that experience of the hurricanes Irma and Maria. And, but you know, the way memory works and the way are triggers from one experience that may be aesthetically to another. It's amazing. Long before the hurricanes hit the island, I, I was on a visit to Paris and I went into, into the Pompidou uh, Museum and I saw a work of art that impressed me very much. It was uh, like art uh, news of uh, advertisements of exhibitions, of art magazines, blurred and erased on a paper. And, and I was taken by that. I was fascinated by the, the erased image. And that, that just stayed with me. I, I take time to reflect on this because it, I think it's important to know that how very varied experiences contribute to art making. Now, that was way before Maria, but when I remember when Maria hit us, it all hit us is right. I mean, not only the hurricane hit us, the total irresponsibility of both the federal government, the island government, the way they negated, the way they shied away from their responsibilities was so insulting. And I, I, I saw that they were erasing our lives, erasing even the, the memory of our lives. Thousands of people died and are still dying because of the hurricanes. So I decided I, I was going to make something like uh, take the obituaries from the newspapers and erase them the way that uh, the government was trying to erase our living and our dead. And also, I'm very tuned to language and what people say, the populists say. And in Puerto Rico at that time, and still now, uh, young guys say, oh, uh, what's going on? What's up? What's up? But what's up in Spanish is, que es la que? Que es lo que está pasando? Que es la que? What's up? And, and you answer, or the government answer, es que la, so, you know, with long stops in between and afterwards. And I just realized that es que la is uh, arbitrary. Es que la, una es que la, it's uh, a death notice. And also it's, it is es que la, when you say together, is ela, with Estado Libre Asociado with the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, that is neither, no es Estado, no es libre, no es asociado, it's neither a state nor associated nor free. So it all gelled together. And I did this piece. And well, with the help of my friends, because all my shows are signed Antonio Martorell y sus amigos. They are wonderful 
people who worked with me and my work would never be the same if it wasn't for them because we, we do it all together and well it was the numbers it was these notices and uh we did books we did family albums and i was so pleased when you took notice of this particular piece and decided it would be at home in in your college in your museum yeah, it is it is it up with all our people over there and so thankful for that and oh. it's a great joy for me to be holding now in that environment well we are honored to have it and i think it's a work that brings together like you said you know an experience that happened on the island um a commentary and a critique on how it was handled and then also it resonates for those of us who live here um because so many people um came here from the island after the hurricane so it's a it's a good way to tell that that story to our communities here and to others who might not be familiar so i'm gonna move ahead i'm gonna skip over this too and i want you to talk a little bit about these works that relate directly to the pandemic. So the one that we're looking at here is a very recent work called Trece Coronas para un Virus or 13 Crowns for a Virus. And this is a work that I had only seen on your uh, on your images. So tell us what, because there's, there's of course a, a wordplay here with political history. Well, he said that it's so recent, it hasn't even been signed. And, <laughs> and this is the first time I see it on screen. And I'm so happy because, you know, artists, we all believe, even if it isn't true, that the last thing we do, the most recent, is the best. Because if not, we wouldn't do it. We, we think of our work as a progression, which is not necessarily so. But I, I'm very pleased to encounter this piece on the screen. And it relates to the AIDS crisis and the installation we did back in 1989, I believe it was. And I learned in order to do that installation, which is, was kind of like a cemetery where the floor was the sky. And then the, we did rubbings of tombstones in three different graveyards in the island. And we had kites with uh, those rubbings on, in color that flew over, like if the gravestones took flight. And it, it, was, it was a marvelous experience. People would go to the installation and sit there and meditate because at the time our government was uh, intent on erasing, just like they did just now with the pandemic and they're still doing uh and they did also with maria erasing the facts the reality that people are dying and especially since this pandemic this uh plague as it was called it was uh hitting mostly or initially the homosexual community and the drug users but far beyond that, it hit everybody else. But they tried to um, stigmatize it that way and, and negate it. So I decided to make all the dead visible. And I did uh, a fast training with a lady in a flower shop in Kaje, uh, where she taught me how to do the ribbons that accompany the uh, this flower arrangement. In the flower arrangements, <laughs> yeah, which is what we see on the screen here. And she taught me how to do it with glue. You write with glue the these messages like your beloved son and daughter, and we never forget you and all that. And I wrote that at that time for the dead of the age played and now i've done it also for our dead in this pandemic and so i took the ribbons and i laid them out on the floor uh my friends helped me glue them and i found out 
suddenly that there were 13 ribbons. I didn't know that. <laughs> and it relates, to, I clicked on me, there's the American flag. And I had done some others that crisscrossed them because I wanted to make like a basket weaving of it all, but I stopped short when I, and then I began also with spray paint to play with it. And, and things happened. Uh, I found out that suddenly twin towers appeared and everything went up in flames and one disaster connected to the other and the whole thing went way uh, and, and fascinated. One of the things that I like most about art making is that you don't do what you want to do or what you know. You do and you learn by doing and you learn in doing what art is all about. It's not what you have in your head, it's what you find out by doing. Yeah, and I think in your case, you know, these works are amazing testaments to the power of art to give voice and to make, to give visibility to those who need to be known and remembered. And so um, I have here a few of the self-portraits, the pandemic self-portraits that you have been doing. And these, um, you know, when I saw these, uh, there are so many associations and references that you draw from here with the use of the textiles and the patterns and this kind of more um, earlier historical looking um, you see, you words. See why, you see why I'm a superficial artist. <laughs> These are all surfaces and they serve me well. So, so how, uh, how has the pandemic changed the way that you see yourself when you work on these self-portraits? And you have here the one of um, Alejandra, and you have done um, portraits of, of others during the pandemic. How is the pandemic changing the way that you see yourself as an artist and well, as a subject for your work? Well, Isela, you know, I love do, doing portraits. Uh, a lot of my work is portraits, and I've done them through the years. And I found myself uh, locked up. And how could I do a portrait if I didn't have the sitters next to me? And <laughs> the pleasure of portrait painting is the conversation, both verbal and nonverbal, that goes between sitter and artist. So I said, I, I, I have to do something to go over this problem. So, I, I learned to use my iPhone and the email, and I began having people send me their selfies and portraits, and I will have them printed, or sometimes even look at the iPhone, and do it in a dialogue with the image and also the surfaces of the materials that I chose to do them with. Like, for instance, the two self-portraits that you see on the left of the screen are uh, done in two uh, carpets that my good friend Umberto Figueroa gave to me. And he said, I'm sure you can do something <laughs> with that because you kind of try to play along with designs that are pre-existent, like pre-existent conditions in the health that's been talked so much about now. So I did, I have these cars that I have on, like I look like a, a cowboy bank robber there. <laughs> and this scarf is a beautiful scarf done by Paloma Suau, the filmmaker who did the feature length documentary on my work called Accidente Feliz. So I did that and the subjacent design is what you see there. Now, the other one is a portrait of my daughter, Alejandra. And I did that on a flowery, uh, beautiful damask uh, fabric. And, and she's gorgeous anyway. Uh, I cannot help saying it because it's true. <laughs> uh, the, the material also helped. And, and it's a beautiful layering of textures, right? It's not just the colors, but the textures and the fact that the figure is sort of veiled. And I think I have a, an image, another example from the series 
Uh, the one with uh, Rosa Luisa here and the yeah. film still of her, that's, her that's video. Rosa Luisa. And there's a mixture because in the background, you see a portrait I did in woodcut over 30 years ago. And then she posed in front of it, and that's her. Mm -hmm. And uh, the thing about this portrait is that it makes, me, it, it makes it possible for me to do all these portraits in a distance. And at first, I just did it of families and friends. And then people got on to hang of it. And, and now they commission me to do that. They pay me to do them. <laughs> so that's another reason for doing at these times where mm -hmm. the art market, like all markets are down. And I have, I have a waiting list to do this pandemic. Portrait. That's wonderful, but I like I like the that that idea of of the figures almost veiled, right? Like there's you know now we wear masks, we are covered. We see here the the film still of Rosa Luisa Marquez's video, where you know of course there's a play on the on the mask to protect our health, but also the theater mask and what that means in terms of identity and um but also being behind windows, right, behind doors when we are quarantined and, and at home. Um, and then um, other approaches. Here we are um, back at the um, installation of the cementerio that you were talking about earlier. The cementerio um, con S, the cement. Uh, it's a cemetery. Uh, with an S. With an S. I, yeah. I, I wanted to make a particular uh, point of, of referring to the means of transmission of the disease and how so this this is the series the that, that this is the series that related to the AIDS epidemic and so again here is is that sense of of memorial and remembrance and giving voice and giving visibility that I think it's a at least in this selection of works comes across um, throughout the selection. Um, and then I wanted to include some of the artists that, that you have talked about, um, Roberto Robin Alicea in particular, who you mentioned in, in your most recent article in the Harvard Latin American Review, um, talking about artists who are dif doing different types of work during the pandemic. And these images, I, I, I really like these images where he's taking that illustration that has now become the symbol for the coronavirus, right? With that, the, the sphere with the little um, elements coming out and has used that as a starting point to create um, these other images. There's a wonderful story behind this because Robin is one of the artists that works with me here at Taller de la Playa. And he's a wonderful artist. And he, uh, his mother owns a bakery shop and she has these doilies and his head and this beautiful uh, use of the doily that's both a doily and a coronavirus. And I use him also to portray, and, and he, he's done hundreds of these guys. I mean, enough to wallpaper a whole gallery and he's going to do it. And I, I'm, I'm very happy for that because he, he develops that looks around it, and I believe in series. You know, I, I always say jokingly, but it, it makes it a point. Uh, I like to do series because series kind of um, keep you from being obsessed of, to solving every problem in one piece. You have the opportunities to do many, I mean, Picasso was a wonder at that because you don't have to solve every aesthetic problem in one piece. You have many possibilities. I always say that if if I ever become a killer, I would be a serial killer. Oh, my God. <laughs> one would not be enough. Okay. <laughs> but that won't happen because you will continue making art, right? So well, um, I, I do I my think... own killing this way. I think I have one before we go to questions or comments from our uh, uh, visitors or virtual audience. I think I included one more 
um, slide here with a different take on the pandemic by another Puerto Rican artist who is um, now represented also in our permanent collection, Carlos Davila Rinaldi, who has been working on um, paintings with these masked um, figures, right? So I think um, while some of, of yours working with texture are very veiled, and in Robin's case, taking the, the image that represents the, the coronavirus in our in our current imaginary, here we have Carlos Davila Rinaldi making these very bold, very colorful um, figures. Well, he, well, Carlos is a wonderful colorist, and I love the way he, he develops the mask in contrast to the colors, not only mask, but also the toilet paper that refers very directly to the paper towel roll <laughs> that uh, the so-called president threw at <laughs> us uh, some time ago on yes. Twitter. Yes. So um, I know that was a very fast and quick look at this selection of works, but I want to allow people some time to submit their questions and comments. If you have questions for Martorell, I have the, the Q&A box open here so I can um, address those. We have a comment from um, Lanesha, um, who is um, saying thanks for converting into expressions of art, all the reality and suffering we experienced three years ago. Amazing work. Um, thank you so much for your feedback. Um, I'm wondering, well, while I get other questions processed through here, I'm wondering, Martorell, if you're going to continue, if you plan to continue developing the series of portraits, of pandemic portraits, oh, or yes, do you yes. think that now that we're facing an election and that, you know, the political climate is also so charged that you may be um, working with that topic as well? Well, I, I always work with that one way or the other, but uh right now i'm working with the pandemic project because i have a long waiting list and i love doing it also but also i'm working on this uh this experience of the videos and the zoom and the system and whatnot this marvelous opportunity of communicating with different people in different places at the same time this is one of the few blessings of this pandemic, the miracle we're witnessing right now. We're, we're talking to you people and showing our work. You know, how many people can go into a show in a museum or in a gallery? And this expands our possibilities. Some working a lot in, in shows and lectures and classes uh, via uh, video and Zoom mm -hmm. and Cisco and whatnot, all this, I, I find it so refreshing and so tempting. And the fact that I'm sometimes I'm, I'm showing my work to people in 15 different cities all over the yeah. world. Yeah, it has been, it has been happened before. Yeah, it, it gives us an opportunity to be here and there. Right, like the like the title of this of this talk. We have a question here from our colleague Susan, who wants to know if you have any plans to visit Rollins, to visit us here at Rollins in the future. Oh, certainly. I this this was planned to be uh, me there before the pandemic, but we had to uh, obey the circumstances and make do with this. But mm -hmm. I love to go there and. Um, listen, I, I, I like very much Florida. I've been there. I have exhibited widely in Florida in the past. And yes, I, I, I go there as soon as it's possible. The possible is the problem. Yes. Um, I have another question here from a friend, Amaris, who says, uh, thank you for bringing the Maestro to Florida. Kindly invite him to move to Florida for us to have more access to him, and congratulations. Um, Thank you so much for the invitation. <laughs> but, uh, uh, at this stage of the game, uh, moving is not that feasible for me. Yeah. Uh, I have quite a, a good thing 
going on here in this workshop uh, with my uh, friends, artists who help me in all these crazy things that I make up. And that's not easy to reproduce elsewhere, but I'd be love to go there and do something there, a workshop, an exhibition, lecture, whatever. I think as soon as that's safe to, to do so, we'll have him here. We have another question from our museum director, Anna, um, that says, um, Martorell, in your art, um, if you can address the notion of art as preserver of memory versus art as maker of new memories. Well, I think art is made up more of continuity than rupture. Uh, I remember a good friend and teacher of mine, Jose Antonio Torres Martino, once told me to be original is not to, you have to distinguish between originality and novelty. Uh, being original is going back to your origins and to feed from that in order to fulfill your present and your future. And I believe that. I believe uh, memory, both personal and collective, uh, both universal and national, is an integral part of art making, is what makes it really original. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see, we have a few more uh, more questions coming in. We have someone, um, Diego, who says, I want to thank Mr. Martorell for sharing all this with us. I remember when he visited the Colegio San Antonio in Rio Piedras when I was a student back in the 90s. And, wow. exci <laughs> and exciting the love of art in all the kids. So great to see him again here. So thank you, D uh, Diego, for joining us. I think that's that's one one of the interesting things about uh, a long career like yours, uh, Martorell, that you have this legacy that you have touched so many different generations of artists, of art students, and curators. Um, and now having you here and having your work here at our museum is allowing us an opportunity to show your work and to tell the story of uh, Puerto Rican art also to our audience audiences here. Let me see if we have time for one more question. Um, okay, so we have a question by our friend Renee. Thank you for joining us, Renee. She says, this is an exciting introduction um, to your fabulous, rich and deep artwork. Thank you for sharing your work and passion. I would love to see your work in person. Do you have any exhibitions scheduled for the future? Do you have any exhibition, uh, exhibitions either here in Florida or elsewhere? Well, we're having uh, a vir virtual exhibition at Museo uh, Las Americas in San Juan related to the Day of the Dead that I did uh, last year in Me Mexico. And I I have many exhibitions, but they're, they're mostly virtual. And, and uh, I, also have one coming up, a virtual exhibition that's going to be done based on a book by our good friend Arcadio Diaz Quiñones, uh, Professor Emeritus of Princeton University, is old Puerto Rican friend of ours, who wrote a splendid book about, uh, it's called Once Tesis Sobre un Crimen en 1989. Uh, 11 Thesis on a Crime of 1989, which is uh, the year right after the U.S. invasion to Puerto Rico. And it's about uh, a trial and a conviction of a cab driver, a horse cab driver that killed a U.S. soldier because he hit him and then he, he made advances to his girlfriend. And it's a long story where he was tried in a, without uh, an interpreter in a, the, after the uh, hostilities had ceased, then he was condemned to death and he was commuted to life sentence sent to Minnesota over there, uh, released after five years. He, 
it reads like a, like fiction. It's almost like a movie, and I did 11 paintings based on that story, and it's going to be shown virtual. Everything That's is virtual now. That's uh, fantastic, and we'll have to... We're making a virtue of virtuality. <laughs> we'll have to find it. We have one more comment and question from our co colleague, Jacqueline. Jacqueline, thank you so much for joining us. Um, she says, it's wonderful to be able to see your very recent work. Maestro, you just mentioned the power of, um, I think the power of art to connect us across geographies. Given how important friends, community, friends and community are for you, and your process, in what other ways are you resisting the isolation that the pandemic has brought upon us? Well, the, I try to reach out <clears throat> to my community, both the immediate and the far away. And I work every day, every single day. And I must say, I don't work out of a sense of duty. I don't work out as a sense of discipline. I work because to me it's my greatest pleasure. And I'm I'm hooked to it. And also I have learned that art is foremost a way of communicating. And I I dedicate my whole life to communication. I am an artist because I love to communicate. Uh, it's to me, art is the type of work, work that you can do sometimes without speaking a word, sometimes without telling the whole story, sometimes with just a color or a contrast. And you, with that, you pose a question. Uh, sometimes an uneasiness, sometimes just make people feel that they have to be curious about what's happening and what to do about it. It's, I think that's the key. It's all a question of being responsible, which is uh, akin to be responsive. That is the key. So I'm going to I'm going to go over one more and then we need to wrap it up. But we have a question and comment from our friend and colleague Gama. Uh, he says, good evening, Maestro. You have been an inspirational figure for many of us. And the question is, dire circumstances and a real sense of theatricality have become part of the matrix of your body of work. Could you please comment on your understanding of the classical theater genre of tragedy and comedy as frameworks to your artwork? Well, I believe that all Puerto Ricans are actors We're in search of an audience. Uh, the question is, is, so many of us, it is hard to be an audience where you're an actor. So, but we are, we're basically theatrical, all of us. And the thing is, we have to channel that in the proper way. Uh, the theatricality is just like the expression of dance, for instance, it's all Puerto Ricans dance. We love to dance. I, <laughs> I myself, I, I dance all the time. And I, I, I think in another time I would have been a dancer. I'm lucky because my daughter became a dancer and choreographer. But the thing is, it is expression. Uh, life is art and art is life. There's no division. But you have to really know yourself, know the other, and how to tap that uh, particular vein and let it flow, let it happen, allow it to be. Don't be afraid. Fear is what you have to fear. Michael, this has been such an amazing conversation and with that last statement that I will take to heart and try to keep fear at bay as we face the upcoming end of this year. I want to thank you so much for the honor of speaking with us today. 
Um, we are delighted to have your work in our collection, and I want to thank everyone who joined us this evening to talk with Martorell about making art during moments of crisis. If you want to learn more about our collection, our exhibitions, visit us at rollins.edu slash CFAM or visit us on social media at CFAM Rollins. Thank you so much for being here and we'll see you next time. Gracias, Martorell. Gracias a ti, un abrazo y un beso a todos. Igualmente. Ustedes. Thank you so much.